Please remain standing in body or in spirit for today's scripture lesson, a reading from 1 Corinthians. Listen for the word of God. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not, does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work powerful deeds? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you still a more excellent way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And friends, please be seated. And thank you so much, Laura, for so wonderfully sharing our New Testament lesson with us today. Well, friends, we join your hearts in prayer as we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you again for the beauty of this day. We thank you for this hour of worship. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've had for us already and all that you will continue to have as we, as we continue in worship today. Lord, we thank you for this special day in which we, we honor our seniors and we honor their journey, we honor their path, and we bless them as they go to the next phase of, of their lives in your name. Now, Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, and all God's people said, amen. amen. I want to start with the question this morning, and the question is, is this. What was the, the time of your life when you felt the most lonely, the most disconnected from other people in life? When was that time for you? And, and think about not only that time in life when you felt most lonely and most disconnected, but, but also think about the impact that it had on your life. How were you feeling? And what impact did it have on you? And as you're kind of collecting your, your thoughts around that, I'll, I'll tell you mine, it was it was a semester when I was at the University of, of Kentucky, and, and it was kind of ironic, isn't it, that I was feeling like the only human being on the planet when I was on a campus with 24,000 other, other people. I'm sitting in auditoriums with hundreds of people listening to lectures. I had a roommate who was my friend from high school, and we actually got along, and I was pledging a fraternity. But you see, the problem wasn't that I didn't have people in my life. My problem is that I just wasn't that well connected to them. And as a result, I felt like I was living on a deserted island. And as a result of that, the impact that it had uh, on, on my life is that I became sullen and, and sad and increasingly depressed and, and eventually was, was a danger of harm to, to myself. And I found myself not only failing in my classes, but failing in, in every way. And something had to change. And fortunately, because of the support of loving family and by the grace of God, they, 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 really, they really did. But I remember that as a dark and difficult time where I felt so profoundly lonely and so isolated from the rest of the world. Well, what about you? 
Maybe it was when you were a child or a teenager, or maybe it was a time in your life when you would had a significant loss in, in your family to relationships or a transition in your career. Maybe it's something that you are experiencing right now during this season of your life. I, I ask the question, I bring up the subject, because, because it's recently been reported pretty, pretty widely to us over the last few years that, that we are in an epidemic in our country of loneliness. And it's quite literally killing us. It was something that researchers and medical professionals and public health people began to, to recognize be, before the pandemic. The pandemic just exacerbated the issue and, and accelerated some things. But studies have indicated that, that about half, about 50% of adults in the United States report feeling a significant sense of, of isolation and, and loneliness. And it's not just something that's that has an impact on us emotionally and spiritually. There are are real physical effects as well. Research has has indicated that the impact of of having a premature death due to to loneliness and feeling disconnected from other human beings, that it, it is roughly the same as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Think about that. It's also been found out that there's a 29% increase in the risk of a stroke. There's a 32% increase of risk in the event of heart disease due to loneliness. If you're an older adult, there's a 50% increase in the risk of dementia due to loneliness and isolation. And this cuts across all, all demographics in our, in our society as well, both young and, and old, across all different races and, and creeds and socioeconomic status. It's a problem that's affecting a great many of all of us across the board. And again, it's killing us figuratively and literally. And what this really points to is is the original not good in the Bible according to God. Think about what God was doing in the very beginning. If you go back to the book of Genesis, God is creating. God is creating the heavens and the earth, the night and the day, the sea and the land, the, the, the creatures and everything that dwells on the earth, including a human being. And, and remember what God kept pronouncing what God was creating as? Give me that word. Good. And at the end of it all, at the end of six days, God didn't just say it was good. God said, this is very good. But we don't get too much farther in that creation narrative till we discover that the things weren't so good. We hear the first not good from from God in Genesis 2, 18. And if you don't remember what it is, it, it had nothing to do with the fall. It had nothing to do with sin. It had nothing to do with brokenness. What it had to do with was loneliness. Genesis 2, 18. God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. It's not good. Why is that? I think it intrinsically gets back to, to how we're created and, and what we ultimately are created for. As, as people of faith, we, we believe the, the, the Bible, that we're somehow created in the, the image and likeness of, of God, that we have some intangible traits about us that somehow mimic and resemble some of the, the very characteristics of, of God. That's why we can be creative, because we have a God who's a, a, a creator. It means that we're capable of, of love and, and art and, and beauty and all the good things that we find in this earth and, and among us, because those are traits that that our God has, that are somehow imprinted on us. And, and when we look at God and we look at how God expresses God's self in the Bible, and we're reminded of it every single Sunday when we do an affirmation of faith, that we have a God who's, who's represented and expresses God's self as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have a triune God, meaning that we have one God in three persons, creator, sustainer, redeemer, And if we're created in that image and likeness of one being who is perfectly in relationship with self, of course it's imprinted on us intrinsically to be in connection and relationships with other people. 
And listen, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about like personality traits, okay? I'm not talking about introvert versus extrovert. I'm not talking about, well, you know, I'm kind of quiet. I'm more of an introvert, so I really don't like being around people that much. Other, well, I really need to be around people because I'm an extrovert and I get lonely really quickly and I lose my energy if I'm not around people every single day. I'm talking about that intrinsic quality about us as human beings, that need we have for connection with other human beings. When I was in seminary, I, I had a, a year-long uh, experience in that where I was engaged in prison ministry, and I found out pretty quickly in that ministry that, that the most dreaded form of, of punishment for, for anybody who was being incarcerated was being put in isolation, because it was when isolation came is when bad things really began to happen to them. It's when they had mental health issues and other health issues. It's when the clock seemed to stop because there was no one else with whom to share life and the time with. Why? Because of how we're created, because of what is put into the very core of who we are, of being relational beings. So that, that way, that, that, that God, and that, that brings us to our, our, our scripture passage today because we have Paul writing to the, the church in, in Corinth, and, and, and as he's writing to them, I want you to keep in mind that of all the ways in which God might have conveyed the the, the love that came down in the life, death, and, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. As Jesus gathered his apostles and he, he gave them what we remember of as the great commission to, to go into all the world, starting right here, and then to Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth, go, he said, teach them to obey my commandments. What I said, baptize them, he said, in the name of the Father, Son, and, and Holy Spirit. What are they being baptized into? Into, of course, the life of Christ and into the community of Christ. And when we get to chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, we have Paul giving a very detailed idea and, and image about what the, what the body of Christ is, about how God chose, the way in which God chose to chiefly convey this love and grace that came to us in Jesus. Yeah, through you and through me and through all of us in the body of Christ now and in all the ones who came before us and in all the ones who will go after us in that long line of the saints that we are a part of. And again, Paul is going into some intricate detail to to describe what this looks like. And he needed to do this. I'm going to say more about this in just a, a few moments. But, but the church in Corinth, they, they were kind of struggling with this. They, they, they weren't entirely getting this thing right of, of how they were fu- to function together as individual members or parts of one whole body. And so the apostle goes to, again, these fairly great lengths. Thank you, Laura, for reading a longer passage so well that we, we usually don't have quite that many verses. And, but I wanted all of that to be heard. Because in the words of Paul, when we, when we really hear them again, it, it really speaks something to the, to the diversity and the unity that we have within the body of Christ, how they're important, how we can't all be just kind of like one thing or, or one type. It, it kind of takes that diversity to create functionality and unity, not just in giftedness, but in perspectives and in outlooks and in worldviews. He also made the point that one part is not more important than the other. So this also gets to our sense of belonging and our sense of identity. He even talks about the different kinds of giftings that we we have as as members of this one body and, and individuals within it. And it's telling us something about ourselves. And it's reminding us something as he's pointing to actual a human body and, and actually some rather rather absurd ways to to make a point that maybe wasn't so obvious to those early Christians in Corinth, and, and maybe I forget sometimes, or maybe you forget sometimes. And, and, and he took this notion of a, of a, of a body, and he, he made the point that the, the head, the, the, or the hand, rather, can't say to the foot, I, I don't have any, any need of you. And the eye can't, you know, say to another part of the body, I don't need you. Uh, that if the whole body, he makes the point, if, if the whole body were an eye, then where would the sense of, of smell be? And you get, the, you get the idea. When he talked about how 
the, the less respected parts or the less attractive parts of the body or the parts that are sore or hurt in some way, uh, that they receive greater care and therefore greater honor and respect because of that versus the ones that seem to need no maintenance. All of that is somehow speaking to how we function as a community of faith, how we are called in this Easter season to be an Easter people who actually live as one body somehow, a body of Christ, as individual parts of that, of that body. And, and I, I really appreciate when, when Paul gets to the, the point where he, he talks about those, those less attractive or those weaker parts or those less meaningful parts. And I doubt any of us got up today wondering, what am I going to cover my hands up with today on my body before I go to church? Or how am I going to cover my face? And, and I imagine that, that none of us have ever had the experience of somebody looking into our eyes and saying, you know what? you have the most beautiful ear I've ever seen. And very few of us, maybe a few of you have heard these words, but my children and my wife has never looked at my feet and said, you have the most incredibly gorgeous feet. I've never heard that before, and maybe you haven't, haven't either. And, and I'll tell you one thing, that, that, that I, um, I don't think about my, my ears that much. I don't think about my, my feet that much. I, I hardly ever think about my lower back until Kathy and I were tiling our screened-in porch about 10 years ago. Somehow, our marriage survived this experience, but my back didn't do so well. And I tell you, after landing myself in the hospital because I I wrecked my back in that season of my life, my lower back receives extreme care and extreme respect in every activity that I do. We don't think about the parts of the body that we don't think about until something goes wrong. We don't think much about our digestive system and our the lower parts of it in particular. You're like, what's he going to say? Well, let let me just say this. We were were in Egypt. I was with parts of my family. I was with a church group. We were on a trip to the Holy Land. And our guides had done so well in keeping us in restaurants that were safe for Americans to eat at without getting sick. And it was our last meal in Cairo. And it was really a choice at the soup. Yeah, there were two soups. There was the creamy, kind of greenish-colored one that I had a funny feeling about. No scientific analysis. I didn't measure the bacteria in it. I had no way, but I just had a funny feeling about it. I made that known to everybody around it. I don't like the looks of that. And then there was the tomato soup, which looked just fine. As it turned out, every single member of our group, including the two members of my family that I happened to be rooming with, they were thinking by the end of that day, they were thinking about parts of their body that they normally don't think about. Bless their hearts. Paul reminds us here that it's those lesser parts that take on great importance in our physical bodies, in our spiritual bodies as well. I don't know how many times over the years that I've had people remark to me as they perform some seemingly small act of service in the church, and it's almost self-deprecating. Well, it is. Well, I just do this, and I only have time for that, and I, I just take care of that, and, and uh, it's, it's all I can do. Or, and I, I very quickly learned as a, as a pastor to affirm those acts of service because they matter. Or, or if somebody says, well, I, I can offer this gift financial or otherwise, but I know it probably doesn't make much of a difference in the life of the church because it's just a drop in a bucket compared to everything that's going on around here. And, uh, but but I, I just think I should do it. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm quick as, as a pastor to, to affirm that, not, not, not just because it's needed and because it makes a difference in the life of the church because any, any act of service and, and any gift financial or otherwise makes a, a difference in our life together, but because it's something that... God has given you, God has given that individual, God has given all of us, and when we somehow share it back, it does something within ourselves as individuals, and it makes a difference in our larger body, no matter how seemingly large or small it could be. And then Paul even talks about gifts here, and the different gifts that are that are so varied in the life of the in the life of, of the church and And have you ever wondered why there are so many different expressions of Christianity around the world? And 
And I think it gets to this idea of gifting and, and why that is necessary. Because if, if there was only one expression of the body of Christ, it, it seems to me that we're just diverse enough around our world that, that the message of God's love in Jesus would likely only reach one culture or one people. And I have to tell you that as a, as a parent who's raised three children in the church and in the faith in our lives, I, I never will forget that experience. With all three of my children, I, I would invariably, Kathy and I, we would, I mean, after raising them in the church, of reading the Bible to them, of praying with them, of telling them in one way or another every single day how much God loves them in Jesus, they go to Camp Lucon for a few days. And they come back all religious, you know? I remember our oldest coming back and saying, Dad, Dad, oh, it was, a, it was an incredible week. You wouldn't, we had worship like I've never experienced worship before. A little hurtful, uh, just a little bit, yeah, just a little. Or, 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 or my son coming back and saying, oh, Dad, oh, just the camp was incredible. Our, our dean, I mean, he really preached the Word of God. Okay, all right. Um, or our, our, our daughter coming back and saying something. I mean, this, this, this actually happened. You know, saying something like, Dad, it was an incredible week of camp. Did you know that God loves us all? That God loves me? Did you know that? No, Hannah, I never heard, and you've never heard me say that before, have you? I mean, you never, of course they had heard Kathy and I say, of course we raised them in all of that, and of course they experienced real and, I think, good worship in the churches they grew up in, preaching music and otherwise, but like any of us, it's helpful to hear it from a different voice, maybe not just your parents or the people closest to you, but from those that you hear it in a different way or a different accent. Do you know how incredibly gifted you are? Do you know how beautifully gifted and equipped you are? Do you know how important every single one of you are to God and to this church and to the people sitting on your left and on your right that he's given each one of you a gift to share? And when we somehow don't share it, when we're held back from it, we're all missing out. And one of the whole points to this passage was that, was that Paul, again, was writing to a group of Christians who, who weren't doing such a great job with this whole community thing, this whole idea that, that we're all part of a body and it's, it's Christ's body and we're individual parts of this one body because there was one very critical ingredient that was missing. I hope you didn't lose that last verse when Laura read to us. Paul said, I will show you a more excellent way. Paul was looking at the tremendous gifts that these Christians, these early Christians in Corinth, Corinth possessed. He also looked at how that church was tearing itself apart and how some were overemphasizing their gifts and underemphasizing the gifts of others. Some were underestimating their own sense of significance. Others were overstating their own sense of significance and import within that body. And Paul named a missing ingredient, and he spent that whole next chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that you hear at every other wedding that you go to, even though it really doesn't have anything to do with a wedding, although it's fine that it's read at weddings, it's called the love poem. Love is patient, and love is kind. Near the end of that chapter, now abide faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is what? Love. It's like the oil in the engine of church. And without it, everything grinds to a halt. And friends, in this season in the life of our church, in a time when our society is really struggling with what love really looks like, I want to encourage you to really focus on how you are loving your neighbors here in the church and and in the world around you, especially people who might think a little differently about one thing or another thing than you do. In, in, a, in what for many of us is a tender time with, with general conference, remember that we are a church who has decided that we have a big table 
and everybody's welcome at that table. We're just asking that we all love and respect each other at that table, and we do that every single day, by the way. We're the kind of church where Democrats and Republicans actually worship and serve and love together, where um, young and old and everybody in between actually worship and serve and and, and work and, and be part of the church together. We're the kind of church on every single day, on a daily basis, where University of Kentucky Wildcat fans and University of Louisville Cardinal fans actually come together and our church and are a people who are one together. Let's continue to be one together. Because our oneness shown in how we love and care for each other, that will be the thing above all else that communicates to the world around us that we belong to Jesus. We're a resurrection people. We're called to receive that light and that love and to share it. And when we do that, our lives, our church, our communities, our world, are never the same. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and will you pray with me? Gracious God, we, we thank you for all the, the expressions of, of love that are happening in this church, all the, the ways care is conveyed, and for the way the giftedness and, and the service of, of those around us is, is offered. Lord, we pray that we would always be in that spirit, and Lord, we're, we're humans, and, and I fail, and we fail at this on, on a daily basis, I, I guess. But, Lord, during this season especially, would, would you just call us very close to this very important ingredient in our life together? Amen.